or code of conduct in the King James Bible. I hate snakes, Shock! I hate them! And may the Christian Lord guide my hand against your Roman popery! And they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! We're on a mission from God. I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Maybe we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby Land where maybe we can find some self confidence for you, you jackwagon! Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting research center. This is Pastor Mike. I'm online and I'm live with you from Area 52, the talk show Hell Hates. And the more you listen, the more you know why. Uh, from what I can gather, there were uh, two people in the Bible, um, and right now I'm thinking Old Testament, and I'm trying to think through the New Testament to see if there was a, a known instance or recorded instance where um, somebody talked to or was confronted with or by a familiar spirit. Um, and I can think of two places right now in the Old Testament where two different people on two different occasions had an encounter with what I would consider to be a familiar spirit. In other words, not one of the good angels. You, you have several you have several places where uh, people had a conversation with an actual messenger of God, an angel sent by God. You have Moses, speaking to the angel of the Lord from the burning bush, who I believe that was Christ, who has not yet been incarnated in this world as the, you know, as the word became flesh. Uh, Abram, or Abraham by now, this is Genesis 18, he meets the two men walking toward him, uh, with Christ with them and they sit down he feeds them a great meal uh, washes their feet I mean he's treating them as if they are right there in front of him and um, so you have you have you have Abraham seeing these angels uh, you you have uh, Gideon Gideon talking to the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord ca calling him and telling him, hey, God's got great things he's going to do for you and through you. And Gideon's always going, you're going to have to reassure me. Give me a sign. Now give me another sign. I mean, that's how Gideon was. Um, who else can I think of? Had actual contact with an angel. Well, we know Elizabeth did. We know Mary did. We know Paul did actual contact with angels and speaking to them, so on and so forth. Uh, those that came to the tomb of Christ, expecting his dead body to be in there, only to see the stone rolled away, and there's an angel sitting there. The Bible says his face is as lightning. I don't know what that looks like, but, uh, but anyway, his face was like lightning, and the angel says, he is not here for he is risen. So we, and then, then, this was interesting. Somebody brought this to my attention. I never thought about this before. I've been telling you for a while that in the Bible, 
aliens and strangers sort of go hand in hand. Whenever you have someone who is a stranger, often the Bible says they are alien. Um, someone saying, I'm a stranger in a strange land. They are an alien in a strange land. Uh, when the Apostle Paul told us, be careful to entertain strangers. For some have entertained angels unawares. Which tells me something. And, the, and I believe this. I believe it on both sides. I believe it on the good angel side and on the bad angel side. I believe that from time to time, humans have interactions with, as Eric Von Daniken would say, extraterrestrial uh, beings, beings from another planet, beings from the heavens, beings from the outer space who ride in chariots and so on. That's how... That's how he would say it. Um, so if you take that idea, the idea that uh, Paul specifically used the word strangers. Be careful to entertain strangers. For some of these are angels unawares. You wouldn't know it until maybe there was something that maybe told you that. I don't, I, I, can, I don't know if I told you this. It's been a while since I mentioned it, but we had... One Sunday afternoon, this was many moons ago, we had a church barbecue uh, at the church Sunday afternoon after the morning worship. We set up a nice pavilion outside. It was sort of a warm day, but it was a nice day to have a, have a little picnic, all right? And um, so anyway, up comes this guy walking up to us and you know of course we got food everywhere and we're all eating and this guy looks like he's been traveling he looks road you know how the, these guys are out in the sun all day so they get real dark and tan and you can tell he's road weary and everything like that and he was understand that our church is within a block of the intersection of Interstate 55, which runs from Chicago clear down to past Memphis, Tennessee. I know that maybe all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. I'm not sure. But there's Interstate 55, which is just right over here. And then Highway 67, Interstate 67, it runs from St. Louis all the way down to at least Little Rock, Arkansas. So we get people every now and then right off the highway that come by and see us. Well, this guy walked up to uh, us having this big picnic. And he's asking for directions. From that point, he's got to get to Chicago. And we asked him all kinds of questions, but the, after a while, the, the thing that popped in my mind was, I wonder if this is an angel. I wonder if it is. As soon as I thought that, I asked the man, when's the last time you had anything to eat? And he said, well, it's been a while. Well, there was no way in the world with us having food laying everywhere that I was going to let that man go off hungry. So we tried to make him, you know, bags and plates or whatever, whatever, something that he could carry, Tupperware dishes, things we didn't mind losing, you know, they cost a little bit, but, you know, God will bless. And... We, we did not send him away empty-handed. In fact, uh, two of the guys in the church, they volunteered to take him from our church up 55 to uh, just where he could cross over into the Illinois side of the Mississippi River. 
using the JB Bridge, which is the southernmost bridge in the St. Louis area. And so we loaded him up with as much food as we thought he could handle or carry or whatever. He didn't, he didn't have much. And the guys that we sent to take him and drop him off said they pulled off the interstate onto a ramp. They dropped him off. They had to go, they had to turn right because there was no way to turn left. They had to turn right, turn around at a gas station. And when they come back, that guy was gone. And I mean, G-O-N-E, gone, disappeared. Just out of, just gone, period. And they came back telling us that. And I thought, well, that was my suspicion, was that this guy was possibly an angel that came through unaware, and we showed courtesy to this man. We showed kindness to man. We even stopped, and we all had a prayer for this, because I think he was trying to see somebody up in Chicago that was dying. And um, as a church, we had prayer over him and so on. Um, I was thinking about him today, and I was thinking about the guy that I led to the Lord. This would be 1987, the same year I got married. I was attending a Bible college in Nashville, Tennessee. And as part of our Christian service once a week, we had to go, they assigned us different places to go, and um, one, one Thursday, I got to go to the guys who went to the Nashville County City Jail. Now, you want to talk about a place of desperation and hopelessness. That's what jails, that's what they're intended to be. And so... Um, this guy's sitting next to me, a black guy, and one of the guys starts preaching. He's preaching up a storm, and I, boy, I'm getting into it. It's a good message. And what we're supposed to do is, after the message, just turn and talk to whoever we're sitting by, ask them if they know the Lord, talk to them about maybe possibly being saved and so on. And I will never forget this, this man sitting next to me I started talking to him. I said, sir, did you, you know, understand what he said? He said, yeah, I did. And I read him some scriptures and I said, sir, do you understand what this Bible's telling you? He said, yeah, I think so. I said, what it means is, is that even though I'm studying to be a preacher, I I'm really no different than you are. And who knows? You know, I don't know what circumstance led you here. I might have done this, the exact same thing. I mean, who knows? I said, but Christ came to forgive us. And I, and I basically walked him through the sinner's prayer that night. Walked him through the sinner's prayer. It was the easiest evangelism I had ever done in my life. And when his eyes lifted up after praying, I could tell they were bloodshot. He had been crying. He wiped his eyes. And I asked him, how do you feel? He said, man, that feels better than a shot of whiskey. And the cons Mr. Conservative in me was wanted to say, well, that's not really an appropriate response for Jesus Christ. But, but the other guy was going, Mike, shut up. Don't ruin it. It's the only thing he knows. And if he thinks this is better than a shot of whiskey, I've got more for him. So I found myself today praying for that guy again. Because, you know, sometimes guys will make deals with God to get out of prison. They get out of prison. They go right back into sin. Maybe this one didn't. Maybe this one's pastoring a church somewhere, and I'll see him in heaven. You never know. Uh, but that blessed me. But talk, and talking to that, that guy that came by our, our church barbecue on the very Sunday that we are gathered outside eating, drinking, being merry. Here comes this guy to crash our party. We have no idea who he is. We could have said, go on, get out of here. We didn't invite you. Get out. What, what kind of church is that, by the way? So, now, in the Old Testament, two people that right now I'm aware of 
that spoke directly to a familiar spirit. The first one is First uh, Samuel 28. Saul, because he's king, he can do and get by with whatever he wants while the people have to suffer for the things that they do. And so here he is thinking that he's, I mean, he's already issued, Saul has issued this decree that nobody can be contacting familiar spirits in the land. That was back when he was right with God. And now he's going to a woman. He sends this guy out, seek me a woman that had the familiar spirit. And behold, there is a woman in 1 Samuel 28, 7. There's a woman in, in Endor that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went, two men with him, that came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done how he hath uh, cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swear to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, that there shall be no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. Now, friends... I don't mean to get into it. I don't want to argue with you. If you want to listen to something, if you come to me and call me or come by here and say, Pastor, I've got something for you. I'd be glad to listen to it. I may not agree with it. I found a recording the other day and I thought about posting it. Because every now and then, somebody will call our ministry or come by, leave their home 200, 400, 800 miles away, only to uh, come here to Bethel so that they could tell me something that they think God has shown them. So back in 2014, and I remember I found the recording. Um, I don't know if you do this, but it, in this age, it's wise, I think, if someone's going to talk to you about a very serious matter, um, it is wise in many cases to record that conversation in the state of Missouri, as long as you're not in law enforcement of any kind, um, there's no law that says you have to let the person you're talking to on the phone know that you have a recording device somewhere that's recording this conversation. They don't, they don't have to, it's called first party knowledge or something like that. You can know about it, but they don't have to know about it. And those, those recordings are legal. Well, there was a guy that pulled in our church parking lot one day and he had a, he had a big old truck. He was a big guy too, big guy. And he kept asking for me, asking for me, asking for me. So I got up and the conversation did not go very well. I'll say that. And as I listened to it and I thought about posting it, as I listened to it, I tried not to try to be persuasive or twist his arm or tell him what an idiot he is for believing this when the Bible clearly says this. I mean, God just put it, I guess, just put it in my heart. And I pick it up nine, what, let's see, how long ago was that? 2014. So that was about seven years ago. And um, God gave me a little bit of grace to not just say to this guy, 
that's the craziest thing I've ever heard of in my life. I'm not going to waste any more time with this. Adios. Um, so he came and he wanted to bring some kind of computer set up in and set it up and hook it up into our network. And I said, sir, let me just tell you, that's not going to happen. I said, I don't know your computer. I don't know you. I don't know, you know, who you are. You may have a computer full of viruses. I don't know, but I can't really do that. And I said, why don't you just tell me what your idea is, why you feel like God sent you here to talk to me, what it is, and then give me the scripture. And he was fumbling papers and he was, you know, kind of, well, I need to, I need to show you this, but I got to show you this first. And you got to hear this before I can tell. I said, just say it, just say it. He said, all right. He said, I know who the two witnesses are. He said, have you read about the two witnesses? Do you know the two witnesses? I said, yeah, I know the Bible account. They're in Revelation 11. And he said, I know who they are. I said, okay. And he said, now we need, to, we need to start out with this scripture over here and go to this scripture over here. And I said, just tell me who they are. Just tell me who they are. And he said, Jesus and God the Father are the two witnesses. And I went, in my mind, immediately, a buzzer went off. He's wrong. And now I know why he had to build this up with Scripture first. But I told him, I said, just cut to the chase. Don't be nervous. Just cut to the chase. Tell me who you think they are. And then, if it's even remotely possible, the Holy Spirit, I guarantee you, draw out verses out of my heart, and I'll be reciting Scripture right along with you. Um, so he tells me this and we're reading Revelation 11 and it specifically says that the two witnesses, the beast that rose up out of the, out of the pit, slew the two witnesses, murdered them, killed them. Their dead bodies laid in the street for three and a half days. I would listen. I'll tell you something. I picked up a corpse one time with uh, a family member who is an embalmer, and at one time he was the county coroner. He picked up all the dead bodies all over the county. And I can tell you, a guy that's been dead three and a half to four days is not in good shape. Just telling you that. Uh. But I said, okay, I got to stop you right here. And he said, no, 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 you got to listen to these verses. I said, no, hold on a second. I can't accept that. And here's why. I said, you're telling me that Jesus, when he comes back, is going to be killed again. He said, that's right, he is. And I said, now you're telling me that God, his father, is going to be killed also in the streets of Jerusalem. He said, in the flesh. I said, God doesn't have flesh. The Bible plainly says that God is a spirit. And he said, well, he said, you didn't let me, you didn't bring my computers in. And I have to go back and I have to show you these scriptures, you know, that, you know, and I said, it doesn't matter. I said, because I cannot fathom any scripture at all that would ever tell us that God the Father himself is going to come down here on this earth and let people kill him. I said, I, there is no scripture that backs that up. And I was very calm with him. Because I could see that as he realized that I wasn't buying what he was selling, he was getting agitated. And he was a bigger guy than I was. And so I was a little bit afraid. 
But I told him, I said, sir, there's just no way in the world that God the Father is one of the two witnesses along with Christ in the book of Revelation. They're not. There's just no way that they can be because you can't kill God. God doesn't die ever. And um, he talked for a while, and a lot of it was just out of the side of his head. It made no sense. I, and I kept saying, what does that have to do with the question that I asked you? How can you show me in the Bible someplace where God, and I mean God the Father, if you can show me someplace where he can be killed, I will gladly take a look at it. But that's a huge stumbling block. So anyway, back to the familiar spirit. Here's a familiar spirit. Saul has, has banned them. He's outlawed them. He goes to the witch at Endor. The witch at Endor brings up a familiar spirit. The familiar spirit says, I'm Samuel, but it's not Samuel. No way, no how is it Samuel. And let me read the text here. Let me put it up on the screen for you. Cause I just, 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 I just. How you like that sound effect? That's pretty cool. Boo, 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 boo. Okay. Anyway, um, let's see here. Verse eleven. Then said the woman, "Whom shall I bring up unto thee?" And he said, "Bring me up Samuel." And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, "Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul." The king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I see gods ascending out of the earth. Gods are there. So think of two things. An identified flying objects. Um, they call them USOs, unidentified sea objects, because some of them come up out of the sea. In this case, they rise up out of the earth. These gods come literally up out of the earth. They ascended up out of the earth. And, I, and he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stopped uh, with his face to the ground, or he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And then we have the place in Job, and, and I'm not, again, I'm not too familiar with another story, another place in the Bible where someone sees a familiar spirit, has contact with an actual spirit. And, but I believe that if good spirits, good angels can make their presence known to us on this earth, then I also believe that evil spirits can and will do likewise. And I, I do honestly believe that. I think that it's highly probable that around us are entities that are not human. They are of the realm of familiar spirits. Some, I believe, from the heavenly realm, some from the earthly realm, down below, somehow, somewhere. But I think that they make incursions into this earth, into this world, do and say things to directly contradict the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the word of God. It's to get people to follow after a spirit that is not speaking in accordance with the word of God is what it's doing. The spirit is saying, we don't care what you listen to, as long as it's not a King James Bible, that's what I, I do believe that. And I believe that people see them. I believe that people have conversations with them. I believe that 
although some of them, I believe, look like you and I. I believe some of them take on various uh, different weird aspects. We, and Ezekiel 1, we have the humanoid-looking living creatures, one with the face of an ox, another with the face of a lion, uh, the other with the face of the eagle, and the other with the face of man. And so I believe that these spirits show up here. And if it's a good spirit, a good angel, God's going to bless that. If you are kind to that stranger, I believe God will bless you as a result of that, whether you know it was an actual angel or not. Now, we never found out that it was an actual. He, the guy never sent us an email saying, guess what? I'm really an angel. Okay. With, you know, light coming out from the back of his head. Like, remember the TV show, Touched by an Angel? Anyway. Uh, now, here's why I bring all this up. Um, there was, I did this a couple years ago, a UFO story, an alien abduction story that really got my attention. And I did a couple Watchmen broadcast about it. Um, Matthew 24, verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Second Corinthians, and this, people, pay attention. Second Corinthians eleven thirteen, For such are false apostles. If men can pose, or, or women, First Liberty Pentecostal Church, led by Apostle Lisa Smith. Well, there's your problem right there. Uh, many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many for such are false apostles, deceitful workers. Look at this, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Now here's one question that a lot of people ask is, Pastor, do you believe that devils can take on different shapes? And I would have to say, I think it's possible. I think it, I think it would be possible. I do. Because these false apostles, uh, Paul later says that these false apostles, uh, where is it? They are transformed as the ministers of righteousness. So I think even these familiar spirits possibly have the ability to change their form and how they appear. Now, there may be, some, to you those that are born again, there may be something about that person that just stands out and you're just going, if that ain't a devil... That's a person possessed with a familiar spirit. I can tell you that right now. You might walk away from certain encounters with people coming off feeling that way. Man, that just felt like a devil to me. Whew, I better get out of here. So we have many coming in his name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And then we have false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Is transformed. He has a transformation that's coming. No longer will he be seen as the bad guy. He's going to be seen as the good guy. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Now, you remember what God did with Saul. He took away his mercy from him. 
And at that point, God took his Holy Spirit away from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled Saul from that day forward. And you can sort of say Saul was changed after that. He was a mean, mean as a rattlesnake, especially when you brought up the name David. I'll kill the next man that says that guy's name. Saul had his little change over there being led by the witch at Endor and the familiar spirit who he really believed was in fact Samuel, even though God has already made a decree. Saul, I'm not ever talking to you again. I'm not talking to you. I'm not going to speak to you. I'm not going to give you any revelation. I'm not going to give you any uh, prophecies. I'm not giving you my word. I'm not giving you anything. So sure enough, familiar spirit pops up. Everybody says that Samuel, even nowadays, people claim that it was Samuel. I'm here to tell you it's not. It wasn't Samuel. Saul died because he got involved with the woman that had a familiar spirit and the familiar spirit itself. He got involved in that. And Saul, God took him for that, eliminated him. No, that doesn't mean he was made into lemonade, not eliminated. That's a good one, by the way. Remember that one. Okay. All right. Now, there was a UFO story that really, really got me fascinated. I will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them, Isaiah 66, 4. Because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before mine eyes and chose that in which I delighted not. They didn't choose the Bible. They didn't choose prayer. They did not choose the, these fundamental things that God told us to do was read our Bibles and pray they decided not to do that. They decided that they're above the Bible. They're so spiritual now, they don't even carry a Bible anymore, much less read it. They don't need to because the Spirit speaks directly to them. And reading the Bible was would be like an adult sitting there with his three-year-old child's coloring book, coloring the pages on it. That's the way some people think. Um... Betty Andreessen, known as this is known as the Andreessen Affair, written by Ray Fowler. Ray Fowler was uh, one of these authors and speakers, and he worked uh, with people who had been abducted or claimed that they had been abducted. Now. You know, there's some speculation as to whether the people really get abducted um, because, you know, they go to bed at night, they wake up the next morning, some things are moved around, some things are changed. They go to a psych psychologist, he hypnotizes them, makes them think that, you know, that, that makes them remember that they went into a spaceship and so on. And uh, again, I, I'm just not sure whether the devils put that in their minds and it never really happens, which I believe is possible. Oh, do I believe it. H have you ever had the devil put anything in your mind? Do you think it's possible now? Yeah, I do. Or were they really taken somewhere, things done to them, and, you know, they have to have hypnosis to bring these things out because these devils and they look like devils these devils possibly implant certain memories into their minds and so on and this is how they remember it when i think that however and i think of the story of travis walton i mean it is a it is a proven case, and since that event happened, what was that, in the early 70s? No one, not one of the, of the guys that were with Travis on that logging crew, not one of them has come forward and said, 
I'll show you the cabin where we kept him in for five days. Not one of them. Travis Walton simply disappeared out of this world. Five days later, he wakes up. He's inside some sort of ship surrounding him. Let me get my pen here. That never runs out of ink. What happened to my pen? I thought I grabbed a pen. Anyway, he wakes up surrounded by all these gray-skinned, uniform-bodied, with some sort of insignia on the left chest. And um, Travis is surrounded by these things, and it scares him. Of course, he scares them. They go running off. He goes out of there, finds a room with some kind of control panel on it and a TV picture with stars on it, and he messes around with the control panel. All of a sudden, the star scene shifts. He's moving the ship, and he's going, uh, maybe I shouldn't do this. And um, so then by that time, a, a much taller person than the gray, someone about of average human height, meets him in the corridor. And um, um, Walton thinks that they're humans. Thank God there's humans around here. Did you see what I see? We need to get these guys. They're little aliens or something. He didn't know. So anyway, but that's what Betty Andreessen, that's what she dealt with. She had, and as far as I know, she's still alive. And I'm not sure if she is still having or maintaining some form of contact with any of these beings. But I do believe that Betty Andreessen actually encountered these creatures, these devils, these familiar spirits, if you wanted to call them that. If you want to call them strangers, that's fine. If you want to call them aliens, that's fine. If you want to call them little bug-eyed monkey men from Mars, you can call them what, whatever you want to call them. But at least two books written, The Andreessen Affair by Ray Fowler, the in, and then The Andreessen Affair Part 2, written by Ray Fowler, and then Betty and her Bob, uh, Be Betty and her Bob, Betty and her husband, Bob, Luca, uh, got together and collaborated on a third book, uh, calling it the true life story of a couple that had to cope not only with the, mo with the reality uh, of the UFO slash alien experience, but harassment by U.S. government agencies as well. And that part, I'm not sure that I believe everything uh, that uh, Mr. Luca says. He says the government got into his computer and stole all of his files or read all of his emails or something like that. I don't remember what it was. But uh, March 5th, 1980, Betty Andreessen was placed under hypnotic regression. Now, let me explain who she is. Betty Andreessen claims now to be a born-again Bible-believing Christian. That's who she claims to be. And she is of a, oh, I'll say more of a, char a charismatic and or Pentecostal persuasion. And with all of the things that she saw over the course of her life and the number of encounters that she had with these beings and the places that they took her and the conversations that she had with uh, an entity that was referred to only as the one, the La Uno, which is a new age term for God is the one. So anyway, that's who she claims to be. She claims to be a born-again, Bible-believing Christian 
that when these alien stranger devils showed up at her house and they start all these abduction things going on and everything like that, she just don't fight it. She goes along with it because she believes that the one that they take her to eventually see is none other than Jesus Christ. She got tricked into believing that this was all God's plan for her life. Now, I can tell you after having read most of the content in these three books, uh, <laughs> I don't, sometimes I don't read the whole book, but um, she has an overall positive encounter with what to me are obviously agents working for the other side, not God's side. Um, and to me, there's absolutely no doubt about it whatsoever. But that's what she believes. She believes the one is Christ or God. She believes these little aliens are angels. And she actually used that verse one time to let them in her house because she said, God said, be careful to entertain strangers for thou might be entertaining an angel unawares. So every time they came to her house, I mean, she had milk and cookies ready for them. She had, you know, had all kinds of things. Let's, let's have a good time now today. And it all started. This is what really got my attention. The first time I saw this, When she was a little girl, about 11 or 12 years old, she is um, sitting in a backyard hut and she sees a small ball of light that circled her about five or six times, circled her head. It made a real dull buzzing sound. She called it a bee. Uh, and it was about the size of a small marble or a bumblebee. Is what she remembers and what she reported. Then, of all things, after this thing flies around her head about five or six times, the, the ball of light lands right here on her forehead and she said the tiny ball of light landed in between my eyes it was cold and I could feel a squiggle deep inside now whatever she meant by that I believe that right then she became possessed or at least entered into by this certain spirit. She could feel that movement deep inside of her body. And then she said, after the ball of light landed on my face, I went slowly and softly backward till I lay on the ground unable to move. So follow me on this one. Ball of light travels around her head, touches her forehead, and instantly, very gently lays her, she falls backwards down to the ground. And even after that encounter, did she start remembering what had happened? No. She, she would forget all about it. Has to be brought out years later uh, by these hypnot hypnotists, almost said ventriloquist. Now that is exact. when I saw that, when I saw that, I was glancing through this book one day, not really reading it because I want to look at the pictures first. 
And I'm looking through this, see if there's any pictures. And when I saw that, Mary, um, Mary Magdalene, I don't know what I'm thinking. Betty Luca, Luca with this thing on her head, touching her head, causing her to fall backward. Exactly what goes on in the Masonic Lodge with the reenactment of the slaying of Hiram Abiff. Hiram Abiff is supposedly the, the builder from Tyrus that Solomon hired to come and build his temple. And Hiram Abiff has the secret. He knows the secret now of how to build temples. So he's a real high level, according to masonry, he's a real high level master mason, and he knows the secrets. And the three ruffians in masonry lore, they come to him and they say, tell us your secret. And he says, I will not tell you my secret. You're going to tell us your secret, or you're going to pay for it with your own life. And so be it. So after so many times of doing this, he refuses to divulge the secret of how to get this rebuild temples. That's a da da da. One of the ruffians smites him. Let's see, how does that go? Uh, smites him in the neck. Another of the ruffians smite him on the left breast. A third, another of the ruffians, or if it's a group, then a third of them, go after him again by hitting him in the forehead. If you remember the wounds that JFK suffered between him and Governor Connolly were Number one, wounded in the throat, the first shot. Number two, uh, wounded in other parts of the body, his wrist. This is the pristine bullet, his wrist. Um, and so, and brother, uh, or Governor Colony's left breast. The bullet that went through Kennedy hit Connolly in the left chest. Then, of course, the kill shot in Dallas, Texas. Right through the head. Just like in Freemasonry. But they beat the guy in the head symbolically in the Masonic Lodge. He has to fall backward. But what happens is the, um, the head of the Masonic Lodge, the Worshipful Master, will come over there and take his hand like this, I've watched it done before, and reach down and grab his arm. This is called the strong grip of the lion's paw, and pulls that master mason back up, that third degree candidate, brings him back up, establishes him on his two feet, and causes him to live once again. Uh, man, we got to open up some Bible here. Revelation 13, because that is exactly, friends, that is exactly what happens with the Antichrist. In Revelation 13, 3, I saw one of his heads uh, as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world... Uh, and all the world wondered after the beast. So what happened to Andreessen? Same thing that happens to the candidate who goes into masonry, which is the exact same thing that happens in charismatic Pentecostal churches around the world. There's no limitation now on where this can go, is there? Happens everywhere. And these people actually believe that this is how you receive the Holy Spirit, is that you have to be slain first. You have to be killed or murdered 
so that you can rise again being full of the Holy Ghost. And I've, I've heard many people say, man, you know, I was tuning along doing fine Christianity, but man, when I got slain in the spirit, I mean, it's just like, you know, turbocharged me. I mean, I'm just running on nuclear fuel, man. I mean, I can't be stopped. They speak as, as if it was a real and total transformation of everything in their life. Better than it's ever been before. But if it's corrupt and it's not in the Bible anywhere, slain in the spirit is a doctrine not found in the scriptures. Doesn't exist. So why are these people doing it? Why did they have to touch him in the forehead? Just like Hiram Abiff, just like the little ball whom she described as like a bee, go into her forehead, into her, into her pineal gland, and it says after the uh, ball landed right... Um, after the ball of light landed on my face, I went slowly and softly backward till I lay on the ground, unable to move. Maybe I should have. Oh, never mind. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. They that, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. And I know it will probably disagree with your current prophecy ideology but I'm going to go ahead and say it I think that on the day of the falling away and it says that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that medicine will be and I and I just have it in my mind that the falling away is an event that happens all over the earth to every man, woman, and child that's on this earth alive at that time with the exception of the saints of God, which I believe, um, I believe, of course, that since the falling away takes place first, that we will be here to view the falling away. I think we're going to go, I think this is the falling away. Look, look at what they're doing. Look at, what they're, look, at, look at what's going on. They're all falling down backwards. And I do. I Call me whatever you want to. But I believe there's a day coming. People are going to be walking outside of their apartments or outside of their cars. They're going to be looking up in the sky. Or they're going to be looking down on the earth because something's happened down there. And I don't know how it's going to be administered, how it'll be broken down. We have all these theories and so on. But I think people are literally going to fall down all over the earth on that day, they're going to fall backwards. And the greatest act of slain in the spirit in human history. That's what I think is going to happen. That day shall not come except the coming away. There come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. I think that's going to happen. I th and I think that at that time, see, here's what I think happened here with Andreessen. 
I think that ball of light flying around her was a devil. Is not, let's go back to, well, let's see here. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 11. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of what? Light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So, I think, what am I doing? Going backwards? No. I think that that ball of light going around Betty Andreessen's head when she was about 11 or 12 years old, I believe it went directly into her forehead. No immunization required. And I think that spirit entered directly into her activating the pineal gland and when the pineal glands activated it doesn't awaken you it puts you to sleep that's what happens and i think that at that point this devil this spirit literally caused her to fall backward like being slain in the spirit she fell down and stayed that way for a, for a season. The Bible doesn't, well, this story doesn't tell us how long. But I think that something similar to that event is what's going to happen. Now, again, I could be so totally wrong. I just know that I know what Babylon has in her cup. Turn to Revelation 17. Verse 3. He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornications. Uh, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. We discussed this issue. Is it possible, possible for someone to become drunk on blood and the answer of course is yes because we know we know for a fact that there is a chemical that's made by your body that travels around in your uh, bloodstream called adrenochrome it is oxidized adrenaline caused by severe pain, severe torture, sickening stuff. And those who practice um, drinking the blood of innocent children after they've terrorized them sufficiently it gives them a high and a euphoria that they never experienced ever before. I had a pastor's wife. Um, I was trying to counsel her because she was... I had confronted her with her, she was having lesbian affairs in the town where her husband was a pastor and her husband was a good guy. 
And you know what she told me? She said, I know it's wrong, but I've never had anything feel like that ever in my life. Now, think about this for a minute. All these people that drink alcohol, why do they drink alcohol? Is it because beer really does taste good? I don't like beer. Ugh. Now, some things might. I'm not an aficionado on alcoholic beverages. But it's what it makes them feel like when they have enough of it to have an effect on their mind and their faculties and so on. Gives them a euphoria that you can't get from eating a can of green beans. You see what I'm saying? Um, a majority of a majority of people I say who are on heroin now started out on pain pills prescribed by a physician. That was made very very plain to me. That you you end up with heroin. Because you've been taking pain pills, and these pain pills give you an euphoria. Well, the heroin does too. But the sad thing is that heroin is probably laced with fentanyl. And fentanyl is a deadly drug. It'll make you feel so good, you won't wake up after that. The, the feeling that people get after committing fornication. You see what I'm saying? The Mystery Babylon woman, she's the one that has the ability to make everyone crave this ultimate satisfaction of fulfilling the lust and the desires of the flesh. Now, just be reasonable for a minute. Just taking normal medications from pharmaceutical companies or eating chicken McNuggets don't do that. And, and I'll say this, getting a vaccine, I never got high after I had a vaccine. I never got a buzz from getting a shot in my arm of, of any kind of vaccine. And no, I have not taken the COVID vaccine. But people just get this euphoria. They get this high. They get this feeling that they've never had before. And it's like they want the ultimate form of that. And I, I believe it. I believe that people go to churches like this because they get it there. They get it there. They get this euphoria. They get this tingling feeling. They get this feeling that of absolute peace and inner calm. And so it's easy to talk them into going forward to get this done to them again because they want it again. And I, I really think that the beast's mark probably has more to do with what and how it's going to make people feel than anything else in the world. They might, they might threaten you and say, well, you're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your job if you, you, know, if you don't do this or you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to buy and sell. And I mean, they can threaten people. But some people just can't be threatened. But every one of us people have a flesh weakness, don't we? Every one of us has a flesh, flesh weakness 
where the devil can just say, see this? Boy, wouldn't this be good? You remember that? Boy, wouldn't that be awesome? I really think that that mark of the beast has like the ultimate sin and the ultimate high in it so much that it just lays everybody out. They literally fall. And who, I mean, who knows how long they're going to stay that way. So, yeah, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Uh, let's see here. There's your pineal gland. Again, let me explain what it is. Uh, and, and be careful, people. People, I, I, along with me warning you to cut back your internet time, I'm expressly going to tell you, do not fall into these new age traps that are on some of these health awareness websites. Because most of them, including Mike Adams, the health ranger, the health ranger, most of these are new age to the core. And their whole business model is based upon the fact that they can convince you that what's wrong with you can be cured by this, that, or the other by releasing your body's natural healing energies. Saying that you've got this energies. That's, I mean, that's kundalini stuff. You've got this serpent needs to rise up and bite your pineal gland to wake you up. Well, that when you activate the pineal gland, it doesn't wake you up. It puts you to sleep. That's what it does. Sort of like my preaching. My preaching guaranteed puts people to sleep. I must have melatonin in my preaching. But that's the focus. That's what, that's what the third eye does, the pineal gland. It, it literally looks like the eye of Horus. To me, that's interesting. I think they dissected a brain at one point, and they said, yep, that's, that's his eye, man. That's what he is. That's who he is. Because, I mean, it is. It looks almost identical to it. Now, here is Manly Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages. Sufficient similarity exists between the Masonic Hiram and the Kundalini of Hindu mysticism to warrant the assumption that Hiram may be considered a symbol also of the spirit fire moving through the sixth ventricle of the spinal column. In other words, he's almost there. The exact science of human regeneration is the lost key of Freemason. For when the spirit fire is lifted up through the 33 degrees or segments of the spinal column and enters into the domed chamber of the human skull, which is a representation of heaven, heaven, because the heavens above us are domed and your skull is a dome. And that's why it's symbolized that way. It finally passes into the pituitary body, Isis, where it invokes Ra, the pineal gland, and demands the sacred name. Oh, operative uh, masonry in the fullest meaning of that. I got to move this. Fullest meaning of that term signifies the process by which the eye of Horus is opened. You shall have your eyes opened. And I got to show you this. because This is cool because he says... The spirit fire is lifted up to the 33 degrees or segments of the spinal column. 
You're going to love this. If you, if, you, if you don't remember this, or you've never heard me say it, you, you're going to love this one. When Satan is lying through his teeth to Eve, you say, was that Genesis 3? Yeah, it was Genesis 3. I counted the words that Satan said to Eve in the Garden of Eden. He says, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes. 33rd word of everything that Satan said. He starts out by saying, um, yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And then he said, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know, and you count all these words, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. That's eyes is the 33rd word in that passage. That's amazing to me. But anyway, the an operative masonry in the fullest meaning of that term signifies the process by which the eye of the eye of Horus is opened. So basically, while the devil is promising you that your mind is going to be open and expanded, that he's there to satisfy all of your lust, all of your greed, all of your desires, all of everything, the truth of it is he's setting you up to burn in the lake of fire with him for all of eternity. Mm-mm-mm. But think of Eve now, and what, what was it that caused her? Was Eve forced um, to eat that, that fruit? Was she, was she forced to do what the devil told her to do? No. Did Satan say, you're going to lose your job and you won't be able to go on trips. You won't be able to fly in airplanes. They're going to take everything away from you if you don't, if you don't receive this. Was that how it was done? No. Then my question is, why do we think that it's done, that the mark of the beast is going to be rolled out that way? That they're going to roll out the mark of the beast and then threaten to shoot and kill everybody that doesn't receive it. Or punish them somehow, some way. I think when the mark of the beast is ready to roll out, whatever it is and in whatever form it takes shape, I honestly believe people are going to want it so bad that they'd be willing to give up everything for that. By the way, do we not, as Bible believers, have something far superior than what they have with Jesus Christ in us? Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world? Of course we do. It's far superior. Kundalini. The idea that you have a coiled serpent at the base of your spinal column. And through certain meditative practices, actually, there's just, there's more than one thing that you can accomplish with yoga. But anyway, but by performing these ritual practices that you can release the spirit that's in your bum and let it rise up the 33 bones of the spinal column until it hits your pineal gland and boy you're in heaven now people wake up wake up the devil's not going to have to threaten anybody so i got ahead of my notes here the devil's not going to have to threaten anybody with taking the mark of the beast. In fact, I think 
I kind of think he has a uh, like a rewards program set up. You know how if you buy gas at a certain gas station a lot, they give you a card and you use that card to keep track of how much gas you bought. And after a while, you have saved up enough points to where, you know, the next time you go, the company can buy your gas for you or whatever. I think the devil has a rewards program. I do. I think that in this world where you have these rich elite chasing after adrenochrome because it's, I mean, it, it, face it, it is a, it is a hard task to go out and steal children and nobody ever find you. And then, believe it or not, turn around and sell these children into a slavery market of some kind. In some cases, they use them in brothels. In some cases, they are just the consorts of wealthy kings. But also, in some places, they are just simply taken, tortured, fiercely tortured. So that the adrenochrome level rises up in their blood. And then they are killed right then and there. And their blood is consumed. So the people can get a high. Unlike any other high in this world. Now doesn't that sound more like the devil than... I'm Dr. Fauci, and I said you're going to lose your job if you don't get... Uh, by the way, by the way, I will say this. California, you got to expect it out of California. Working on legislation right now to come up with a digital passport. A digital passport to show that when you travel and go around that you've been vaccinated against COVID or whatever, whatever the next disease that comes out is going to be that you've already been inoculated against it. And the chances of you getting it are low and spreading it around are low. The California's coming out with a digital, not just a card, but a digital passport, something you put on your phone, you show it to them, when you go in and they let you in and do all this stuff. And yeah, that stuff, that stuff's coming. I believe that. But I tell you, I, I just, I'm not going to, I'm not going to forget the things that I've seen in the scriptures, how the devil works, what he does. Does he work best by coercion or does he work best by uh, flirtation? getting you to want to fulfill the desires and the lusts of your flesh and of your eyes and the pride of your life. I think, I think the deliverance of the mark of the beast is going to be more like that than all of the coercive tactics that they may have tried already, found out that they didn't work. That's how I think it's, that's how I think it's going to be done. Uh, I'm going to skip out a little early today. My stomach's bothering me again. Imagine that. PMO day. Not feeling all that good. I may visit some more of this Betty Andreessen thing on Tuesday because I, I think it's a very interesting story about how she ends up meeting a god, literally a god, who refers to himself as the one. And we may go over that next Tuesday. I've recorded the next Watchmen broadcast. Um, I hated to do this, but I am going to place a banner at the front end of this Watchmen broadcast. And we'll just say that it's rated PG-13. No, I'm not using foul language in it. Nothing like that. 
but it is something that's not really entirely made for children because as soon as they watch it, they're going to have a ton of questions from mom and dad. And I just you know, want to warn you up front that there's an issue that I'm going to be addressing in this Watchman broadcast that you may not want your kids to bring it up. It may be too young for them. Okay? It's kind of birds and bees stuff. Not vulgar. I tried to do it as tastefully as I could, but anyway, that's not what it does. So you pray that I get that edited and get it ready and get ready for church Sunday. We're learning about prayer. Let me ask you a question. Have you prayed today? Have you talked to Jesus today? Have you spent a little time with God today? If not, as soon as you see this thing, think Bible. Maybe you'll stop and pray. How's that? There it is. 